Well, it's been an interesting day in Manx politics. We've had two ministers uh, on this morning at the briefing, and uh, well, the main person being talked about was Mr. Cannon, who's with us now. Uh, are you surprised with the the conversations that we've been having with the ministers about you and, to some degree, Brenda Cannell, but about you and your behaviour as it's being put with your position in charge of the Public Accounts Committee? Well, so possibly. I mean, I find it. Uh, slightly surprising that you should be subjected to that level of attack when you clear when when what you've been doing is questioning a government policy so i guess i've touched the raw nerve um they felt that they've had to respond in, in such a manner but the, the point is um i was challenging the government on their priorities primarily uh, and i was saying that the pension fund the national insurance fund was not their priority at the moment their priority should be the rebalancing their priority should be leading by example by addressing some of the central expenditure core central expenditure issues such as public sector pensions such as the expense of the legislature leading by example on that front rebalancing the books and then dealing uh, alongside that with the national insurance fund but it's to be conducting the business in the way they're conducting business to me seems a disproportionate sense of, of priorities or getting their priorities wrong. The, the main stance here is that you're head of this committee, you, should you really be saying these sort of things when you're still taking evidence? Well, first of all, these are my personal views uh, and not the views of the Public Accounts Committee of which I am uh, chairman. Secondly, I don't believe I've said anything that interferes with the business of that committee. I merely said it remained to be seen whether the expenditure of £775,000 on consultants on this subject was justified. And the other point is I find it very surprising government ministers calling for a backbencher's resignation. I didn't think people resigned in the Isle of Man government. You don't see ministers resigning over uh, illegal loans. You don't see ministers resigning over failure to uh, run their departments. Properly. So I find it surprising that uh, you've got two government ministers asking a backbencher to resign from his position in a scrutiny committee merely because he's challenging uh, the priorities that, in which they're conducting their business. Well, I think, I mean, you say it's your personal views, but I mean, he's, I presume, it was the way it came across this morning, was that you, you, how can you be effective being impartial on this committee when you've made your views so well known now? As I said, Paul, mm. I merely questioned and stated that the there was some explaining to do as to why the £775,000 was spent. And I was questioning the priorities of the government and I was suggesting that the government, by carrying on the priority of the National Insurance Fund in the way that it was, was causing unnecessary uh, alarm amongst pensioners. Now the facts are, the facts are, from the last actuarial report that Tinwald had, were the actuaries, the UK government actuaries clearly stated that fund would not run out until 2056. They clearly present a picture of the fund increasing in that period. They clearly state that a number of actions are being taken to help the situation, including raising the retirement age. And they clearly state that the next report will be due in 2015. So based on that evidence, I'm merely giving the Minister's advance warning that one of the questions that I will have as Chairman of the Public Accounts Committee is why the expenditure on a different set of consultants was necessary, given that we've got these facts laid out before us in the Government Actuaries Department's report. Are you not causing a bit of panic by, by doing what you've done, though, causing stress and, and, and probably some concern amongst people with their pensions? Well, th th this concern is building up and building up. My job is to question government policy where I see fit to, on behalf of my constituents. And in this case, I felt it was right and appropriate to perhaps focus some minds in government that there are other priorities. And that really the priority, the most important priority for government is to balance what you might call its current account, i.e. what it spends on a day-to-day -day basis um, servicing um, uh, the, the infrastructure of, of the island. Now, we have a situation where the National Insurance Fund is uh, provided for from um, people's salaries, is paid into by uh, employed and self-employed people, and that fund is, is quite separate um, from uh, the, the sort of course central government revenue expenditure on 
other items. It doesn't, for example, pay for roads. It doesn't, for example, pay uh, for uh, the predominant, the majority of healthcare. What it does pay for is pensions and benefits. Uh, and therefore, you know, the priority is to get ourselves back in balance. And this fund, according to the UK government actuary, is fine for a significant number of years yet. Back to what was said, uh, one of the media interviews, I think Chris Shaw used words, he's disgusted with your, your behaviour. I mean, that's quite very strong wording. Well, I'm not about to, to lower myself into a slanging match with Chris Robertshaw. I mean, you know, he's using very, very strong language. Um, but, you know, I've challenged the government policy on this. You know, you expect to be um, challenged back, and quite rightly so. I think, um, you know, clearly the Council of Ministers have felt so strongly about it that they want to use language like that. That's fine. I'm, I'm not about to um, start hurling in personal insults around the room. Will you step down? No, oh, I haven't done anything or said anything when you analyse it that would in any way compromise my position. Um, and I feel well, they, they think you have. Well, it's very, it's it's fine how on one hand, whenever you challenge the council of ministers, they appear to have done nothing wrong, and yet, uh, as soon as they get challenged on a perfectly reasonable, um, in, in a perfectly reasonable manner against a perfectly reasonable policy, you somehow find yourself the subject of of personal abuse, and that's fine. For me, I just want to concentrate on the facts of the matter. I want to concentrate on what I believe are the right priorities for government, and I want to make sure that, 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 that executive government is being held to account properly um, for its actions, and, and I believe I was justified in carrying but, out the, the statements that I've made. Forgetting you, the, the, the chairman of this, I mean, you're a backbencher. These are people in Coman, they're, they, they're kind of saying, they're the ones that are doing it quietly, getting on with a job, and you're causing them problems because these sort of headlines wow. is not doing them any help at, or favours. It was quite interesting to hear Mr. Robertshaw sort of throw that a, uh, allegation back that I hadn't done anything uh, as chairman of the Public Sector Pensions um, Authority. Well, and then to say that he, in the last week or so, has got a group together to start looking at it. Well, that's actually fundamentally untrue uh, and wrong, because Mr. Robertshaw hasn't done that. Tinwall did that via a motion that was brought forward by Howard Quayle um, in January, which I had the privilege of standing up to support, and uh, I brought forward uh, the likely areas of scrutiny that that committee was likely to study, including capping pensions, including looking at career averages, looking at capping the salary levels that pensions should, should be considered at. And during my time as public chairman of the Public Sector Pensions Authority, um, from its formation, which I was uh, privileged to, to chair on behalf of the uh, public and, and, of course, the workforce who, have a, who are a stakeholder in that, I have sought to make sure that the full facts, the full extent of the problems with public sector pensions were brought out into the public domain. So I find it very uh, surprising that despite the fact that it was Tinwald who told executive government to get on and sort out public sector pensions under a lot of um, pressure from uh, the likes of Howard Quayle and myself, that Mr. Robert Shaw wants to claim his glory for that. But of course, you know, I guess he's gone into the position, so he, he will do. I mean, any intimidation coming back? Because, I mean, the Friday briefing, they, the one subject was, and that's what we were told, mm. these two, mini two ministers mm. were going to discuss this again, which is quite unusual in itself. I mean, it seems you've touched some sort of raw nerve. Uh, are you now going to back off? Well, I'm not backing off anything, Paul. I've made my case. I've, I've simply stated um, the facts as I see them in terms of where government's priorities lie. I've told you that I believe government had, didn't set out a clear plan at the beginning in terms of the rebalancing. I've told you that I feel uh, strongly that government should have set much more of an example both in looking at public sector pensions and the cost of the legislature. Instead, those two areas have been led predominantly by the backbenchers um, in, in both cases. It's Peter Caron who's having to bring forward a private member's bill about um, the Legislative Council and reforms there. But those types of costs and, and that cost bearing would have set the example for the public and they would have had much more understanding when we as politicians start pontificating about how we're going to be potentially cutting pensions or removing public uh, the pension supplement. You know? And that's potentially probably where I felt the most uh, strongly was that re we need to have a clear example from government, we need clear leadership, we clearly need to not only set an example but communicate effectively with the public what their burden 
cost burden will be, both in terms of uh, the, the, the rates and taxes and also when you look at where these additional costs, cost-cutting effects, if you like, when, or pension reductions are coming in. Finally, does, does this sort of bickering in public help Isle of Man PLC, or do you see where they were coming from, that they, they're getting on with it, and you know. are you're a distraction for them? Well, <laughs> anybody who challenges the council of minister's policy is seen as, as, as a distraction for them. But, uh, you know, my um, constituents and the people of the island don't always share the same views as the council of ministers. I don't share the same views necessarily as the council of ministers. Perfectly entitled to challenge the policy. I'm perfectly happy to have that challenged knockback. Uh, of course, I mean, I'm slightly surprised when it degenerates into uh, sort of personal name calling, but I, I'm not really in that business, Paul. For me, it's about the policies. I'm really happy that, you know, we have proper policy debates. I'm happy that policies are challenged. Certainly, I would welcome that as, as uh, a minister uh, and the council ministers, because it would be a great platform from which to uh, state your case. So don't ask me to sort of go down to, to that sort of level about uh, sort of personal criticisms of individuals and, and calls to resign because clearly that, that example is not one that well, should be followed. That's what I'm going to finish with. I mean, you're not going to resign then? No. I, I, unless my, my position actually is put in by, by Tinwald. Tinwald voted me in. If I believe that the majority uh, of my Tinwald colleagues believe that I should step down and call on me to do so in Tinwall, then of course I, I will do that. And you know, I'm quite willing to accept that. But as far as two ministers uh, adopting this position that a backbencher should resign from a policy review committee merely because he's raised some questions about the way they're conducting their policies, to me is just not a resigning matter. And particularly, as I've said, you know, we've had about two, at least two, if not three instances in this uh, two and a half years of this current administration where there's been very strong evidence to suggest that ministers are, should resign and of course, uh, well, we know the outcome of that, it just doesn't happen.